Good morning. It's great to be with you again. I speak in praise of praise, of attending to the praiseworthy and recognizing it. My more specific subject is admiration in sport, a comparatively unheralded feature of sports value. While we readily, ad while we readily recognize the value of many things that people admire, an astronaut's launch, uh, the medical researcher's latest discovery, we do not sufficiently appreciate that admiration itself is a life-enhancing good. Sport is an arena rich with occasion for looking up, in which fans can experience this value and reap its benefits. Why does this matter? At a time when much in the world around us seems distinctly unadmirable, and when admiration itself is cast as naive, if not delusional, sport presents tangible counter evidence to our darker conclusions. It offers ref refreshing displays of human beings doing difficult things. Shining a spotlight on the good, in turn, can pay dividends. My thesis is modest, namely, that among the values that sport fandom offers is the opportunity for admiration. Yet that value is substantial, for looking up can encourage aiming up. Being attuned to sport's abundant admirable displays can enrich your sense of life, your sense of man, as well as your own efforts. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, but I'm not a sports fan. It just doesn't do it for me. I should have kept the bar open for this session, you know. Um, <laughs> I hear you, and I'm not trying to convert anyone. Some of my favorite people are sports fans, uh, or are not sports fans, okay? Um, uh, well, my real no, but, uh, <laughs> No, it's a matter of taste. You like it or you don't. I'm not trying to convert anyone. Um, just as people have different tastes in the arts. Some people like sculpture more than painting or vice versa. Some people love science fiction. No, no, give me historical fiction or not that kind of fiction, whatever. Um, but, you know, I do worry about you who aren't sport fans. And I was worrying the other night to my partner. And, you know, what are these poor non-fans going to do? But she was reassuring. She said, oh, don't worry about it. We put up with a lot. Uh, <laughs> But I didn't think that was quite sufficient motivation, you know, just bear it, it will end. So let me say a little bit more, which I do think, I think is valid. Fans are not fans. Objectivists are valuers, and objectivists respect ability and achievement. So I do hope that by explaining some of what attracts a lot of people to sport, you who aren't fans will gain some understanding of the genuine value that it offers. Moreover, the admirable traits that we see in sport are not entirely athletic by any means. Many are qualities of obvious application in other realms, like tenacity, intelligence, anticipation and foresight, quick-wittedness, dedication. These are objectively good things far beyond the playing fields. Lars Christensen, in his lecture the other day, telling us a little bit about his own career and work, um, was asked in the Q&A, what particular qualities distinguish some of the best workers you've had? And one that he pointed out was persistence, which is obviously something we often see on display with athletes, okay? Uh, I should note, in talking about the appeal of sport, I don't mean to imply that fans are con conscious of this, that, oh, yes, you know, if you talk to the average fan, he's going to report, oh, part of what I enjoy about sport or part of why I follow is that it is admirable, but I think at a subconscious level this does work for a lot of fans, not all, okay? And just coming back to the crowd, non-fans, fans, for those of us who are fans, bear in mind, this is further evidence of a benevolent universe, right? We get to explore objectivism all week, and then we get to talk about sports too. Can, can you beat that? Okay. Okay, everyone should have a handout which has my basic outline on it, as well as a few other quotations that I will point to at, at relevant times and a few other things, maybe. To support my thesis, I must show both that sport offers objects worthy of admiration and that admiration is good. 
So I'm going to begin with brief explanation of what admiration is, very brief, then explain the kind of thing that sport offers to admire. The bulk of the lecture makes the case for the value of athletic admiration. And this is broken into, I've broken this into three primary ways in which I think it contributes to a flourishing life. Through what it displays, through what it energizes, and through the feelings that it fosters. Then we will probably also have time for me to address a couple of potential objections before concluding. So first, what admiration is. That's a plastic straw. <laughs> uh, <laughs> defiantly plastic, for those of you who were here earlier in the week, yeah. Uh, what admiration is. Simply, I'm just going to read you without citing this dictionary, that dictionary, a few of passages from dictionaries. To admire is to consider praiseworthy or excellent, to regard with esteem or approbation, to appreciate, to look at with pleasure or enjoyment, to feel respect and approval for. To admire, I'm sorry, that was to admire. Admiration, in turn, is regard for someone or something considered praiseworthy or excellent. A few other quick definitions. Respect and warm approval a feeling of strong approval or delight with regard to someone or something. Okay. So in my words, admiration is a form, and this is not a definition, but admiration is a form of valuing. It reflects a positive appraisal. Yet it's not simply an evaluation, for it typically involves feeling, feeling favorably toward the thing admired. And even some of those dictionary excerpts that I gave you bring this out. I think there were references to delight and warm approval. Admiration is felt as well as thought. It's a positive appraisal infused with an agreeable feeling. While we might stress either one of those on a given occasion, the feeling or the thought, the cognitive evaluation, I think admiration really involves the combination. People admire different things in different fields on different grounds, but what unites experiences of admiration is that they are responses to apparent value. Admiration implies judgment that the thing admired is good. When you think that something is admirable, you think that it warrants a certain respect. Moreover, admiration is a response to unusual goodness. While you can respect basic competence or adequate performance, admiration is reserved for, for what you consider a cut above, right? The painting that is especially skillful, the product with innovative design, the workers who go beyond the expected, and so on. To solidify our grasp a little bit further, though, I think it's helpful to differentiate admiration from a few other concepts in the same general vicinity. Time doesn't allow me to fully explain all of these, but I do want to give you a quick list of some things that it shouldn't, that admiration shouldn't be confused with, okay? Admiration is not just the same as liking or enjoying. You can like something with some ambivalence about the fact that you like it, right? You can enjoy something while feeling guilty even over the fact that you do. Oh, I really enjoyed that joke, but that was kind of weird, right? Or, you know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't. Or you can enjoy the friend's salacious gossip, uh, gossip while feeling that you shouldn't. Nor is admiration the same as praise. You can praise something insincerely without actually admiring it, just as you can admire something without expressing that estimate, without actually praising. Admiration is not the same. Again, they're related and they might overlap in various cases, but admiration is not just the same as respect. Admiration is respect with a warm glow, robed in feeling a certain attraction and enthusiasm. It is more than sheer intellectual esteem. To admire is to see and to savor something good in another person. It reflects not only a positive appraisal, but a kind of welcome. If envy is hatred of the good for being the good, admiration is something like love of the good for being the good. The admirer relishes the goodness. Again, admiration is not gratitude. 
though it will sometimes bring that along, right? Thanks for the thing, the person whom you admire. And finally, admiration is not strictly a form of justice. Just, now, again, you have a much longer explanation here, but just quickly, justice encompasses negative as well as positive evaluations of other people, right? So it's different from admiration where the focus is just on the positive. Positive evaluations are not necessarily accompanied by warm feelings, and I've said that admiration typically involves feeling as well as a certain thought or judgment. And admiration does not necessarily result in a person's giving the admired what he deserves, which is what justice demands. Okay. Now, I don't want what admiration is to be lost in all of my, well, now it's not this, it's not that, so let me just restate the essence of admiration, and this is not the most elegant, but uh, essentially, admiration is positive appraisal of another person, another person's particularly distinguished accomplishments or character, sheathed in warm feelings of approval. Okay, that's the basic phenomenon that we're talking about. So, what is it that we admire in sports? What's the object? This is part three, if you're following the outline. What is it that we admire? It's not simply victory. Somebody wins nearly every game, except from ties, and of course they're more common in some sports, but you know, that's relatively rare. Somebody wins nearly every game. Rather, what we admire is the most difficult accomplishments, the most demanding or unusual, the performance that dominates the opponent, the comeback from the deepest deficit, the sustained excellence of those who most consistently reach the final rounds. The sports world's focus is on quality, on the finest performances, the superlative displays. Mediocrity does not suffice. Coaches are fired all the time for failing to make the playoffs. Coaches are fired frequently for making the playoffs but not advancing far enough in the postseason. Right? Excellence is the yardstick. The highlight reel is a staple as broadcasters replay the best shots of the week the most incredible catches, the most amazing athleticism, the runner's unfathomable twist to elude the tag at the plate, the most steely displays of poise under pressure. Analysts dissect the unlikely performances. How did they manage to do that? Leagues field teams and teams play matches that are often highly competitive with skills and abilities so closely matched as to push players to new heights. Fans, as a result, feast on a steady diet of impressive play. We witness, as one writer put it, the extraordinary made to look ordinary. And it's not purely physical prowess that we applaud. The meaning of Olympics medals is not reducible to the times or the records of those who earn them. Rather, as a contemporary philosopher notes, and this is not an objectivist, I'm going to be quoting in here today some people who are not objectivists who actually have good things to say, and they're contemporary people, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> rather, as it, so again, I'm talking about the Olympics medals, it's not reducible to, oh, that was the time, that was the record. The meaning of the medals, as he puts it, lies in the ideals they embody, in the disciplined cultivation of excellence they represent. Close his quote. According to another contemporary philosopher historian, the Olympics, going back to ancient times, ancient Greece, have always been a celebration of human effort and achievement, a matter of inspiration and ideals. Among those ideals are such qualities as self-discipline, application, effort, perseverance, teamwork, courage, class, magnanimity. It's commonplace for fans to hail the genius of a particular play call, the daring of a bold gamble, the grit and determination or sheer self-confidence of the team that climbs its way back from being heavily outscored. Others extol the aesthetic satisfaction that sport sometimes provides. At a simpler level, we can say sport gives us greatness. This is what we salute as we select players for the all-star game, name the MVP, induct career standouts into the Hall of Fame. And you all know where the NFL Hall of Fame is, don't you? It's near in Ohio, Canton, Ohio, about an hour outside of uh, Cleveland, FYI. 
I'll be there. I was there once 20 years ago, and it's, it's time for another visit. Okay. Sport is an ongoing celebration of mosts and firsts and bests. Sport is a distinctively goal-driven enterprise, as games are designed around clear objectives. Correspondingly, it's a realm of aspiration, but also of ambition. Players are encouraged to aim high, to win not just today's game, but the league, the championship, to finish first, to conquer all. In response, athletes continually strive to improve, to be ever better. The Olympic motto, faster, higher, stronger. Even new champions quickly pledge themselves to repeating. We got to repeat, right? Sport rewards the virtue of pride, which you'll recall Ayn Rand characterized as a moral virtue consisting in the, the commitment to achieve one's moral perfection. Moral ambitiousness. So there's a form of that operating here. Indeed, sport is one of the rare realms in which we unabashedly attribute perfection to human performance. He pitched a perfect game. He bowled a perfect 300. She scored a perfect 10 on the high beam or whatever. <coughs> Fans exult over what they can only describe as the perfect pitch. Oh, the perfect call. We delight in seeing something's being done exactly as it should be, in an ideal being realized. Sport holds players to high standards. Correspondingly, when athletes succeed along that ambitious a quest, it arouses more than a passing nod. The very difficulty of the undertaking is an object of our esteem. Trigger warning, here comes a cliche. Sport offers a field of dreams. And one of the objects of our admiration is the dedicated effort of the dreamers, right? Those who we watch compete on the field, they may succeed or they may fail, but they try. There is glory in that. We see athletes give their all. They risk failure and they do it in a public, no room for denial forum. This itself, I think, is one of the values that sport offers. In an era when fraudulence and fakery are increasingly commonplace and image is widely elevated above reality, we do not offer encounter such genuineness. I quote my friend Joseph Epstein, so on the handout you have a longish quote. I refer to this man as my friend. I have never met him, but I can tell you more about that if you're interested. But he's got a nice passage here on, um, on what I'm talking about, the genuineness that we see in sport. He writes, sport may be the toy department of life, but one of its abiding compensations is that, at least on the field, it is the real thing. On the court, down on the field, sport is fraud-free and fake-proof. With a full count and two men on, his team down by one run in the last of the eighth, a batter as well as a pitcher is beyond the aid of public relations. <laughs> at ma it's true, right? At match point at Wimbledon, a player's press clippings are of no help. Last year's earnings will not sink a 12-foot putt on the 18th at Augusta. In all these situations and hundreds of others, a man either comes through or he doesn't. He is alone out there, naked but for his ability, which counts for everything. Something there is that is elemental about this and something greatly satisfying to watch. Yet it is not only striving that elicits admiration. Sport is a realm where dreams are realized. Goals are transformed from aspirations to reality. We admire effort, but more we admire successful effort. As the same Joseph Epstein also remarks, the grand spectacle of people coming through, coming through, is one of the keenest pleasures of watching sports. Okay. So suppose that sport does provide things to admire. What good is that? What's, why is it valuable to see admirable accomplishments? So this is now part four, and this is the bulk of the talk. My answer isolates three principal forms of the value involved concerning what the admirable in sport displays, what it does, and how it feels. But I, of these three, we're going to be on the first, A, 
uh, for a long time, okay? So don't think you've, I'll tell you when we, get, when we get beyond that. I have a lot to say on this first about what it displays. Ad, uh, okay, so first, the admirable displays in sport are valuable for what they show. Consider the inherent hopefulness of sport. Though, I mean, and that's a well-known motif in sport. You know, there's always hope. You're always thinking better, you know, we'll do better next year. We can win this one. The way that athletes seed or nourish hope is by overcoming limits and extending our sense of what is possible. On the field, things frequently happen that are hard to believe. Performances frequently defy credulity, as headline writers eagerly attest. American football fans refer without irony to the miracle in Miami, right? You all remember that, the Doug Flutie pass. I mean, the football fans will, right? Or the immaculate reception, Pittsburgh Steelers fans, but a lot of people in the NFL, right? It's in sport, as a British sport writer observes, you can witness the impossible taking place before your eyes. After the show, reality comes home altered, bettered, brightened. The viewer's conception of reality is enriched. Another contemporary philosopher who was in the stadium at the Beijing Olympics on the night that Hussein Bolt won the 100 meter, uh, 100 meter final, uh, wrote that Bolt's feet gave her a qualitative feat, I'm sorry, a qualitative feeling of what humanity is capable of. Witnessing great performances extends the boundaries of what people consider doable, of what odds and adversity can be overcome. Subconsciously, a fan absorbs the idea, they can do that. Maybe I can do this. Maybe my challenges aren't so impossible. Admirable athletic accomplishments send the message, don't underestimate potential. Frank Bruni, New York Times columnist, writing about Olympic athletes, observes that in a world rife with failure and compromise, they, these athletes, are dedicated to the proposition that limits are entirely negotiable. In this way, as another writer puts it, a true hero has some power to make us a gift of a larger life. The means by which sport suggests what's possible is through the athlete's actual accomplishments. Sport doesn't merely spin tales that offer a burnished image of what is possible. It shows good things achieved. For fans, seeing players' success offers a concrete display of the fact that difficult goals are attainable. As I mentioned earlier, sport is a goal-driven enterprise. Right? When you're first introduced to a sport, uh, the first thing you hear is the object of the game is such and such. Right? You want to get the ball in that net more than they get it in that and so on. And then from there, you learn what the individual players are trying to do, what their goals are, if he's the shortstop or the forward in a different sport, and so on, right? And then we watch the fans, right? We see the when we see the athlete doing it, his accomplishment uh, testifies to human efficacy, purposeful action successfully completed. And when his success is distinctly a cut above, against all odds, or unusually difficult, we see that larger life that I quoted a moment ago. From still a different angle, the admirable in sport shows man in a good light. By demonstrating impressive feats as within our reach, athletic heroics elevate the image of mankind. They are an affirmation of our powers. The one-time commissioner of baseball, Bart Giamatti, who is also the president of Yale, and is also the father of the actor, um, Paul Giamatti. Some of you know him, anyway. Bart Giamatti said, we watch, he wrote, we watch games to become godlike in our worship of one another. Now that might sound a little bit grandiose, but stadiums have often been likened to cathedrals, draped in ceremony and ritual where fans gather to worship. The striving that they witness, along with the fruition, the risks and the dazzling displays that deliver the rewards, they're a sight to behold. Compare Ayn Rand discussing the launch of Apollo 11, appreciating the camaraderie of the congregants, the brotherhood of values among those watching it or celebrating at the parade a few days later. She might not have been a sports fan of any particular note, but she was no fool. 
You heard it here first, right? In a very different context, I said some of my favorite people are not sports fans, you know? Yeah, she counts, she counts. <laughs> that was, oof. I mean, even in jest, that was, no. Thank you, Miss Rand. In yet a different, very different context, Ayn Rand's remarks on the value of romantic art for children. And I have this quotation on your handout, though I'm only going to read a brief end of it, I think. Uh, so she's talking about the value of romantic art for children. There she lauds the emotional experience of admiration, the experience of looking up to a hero. In short, a valuable part of what sport offers is the occasion to watch our fellow men acquitting themselves well. As a Sports Illustrated columnist has remarked, part of the aim in sport is not to win, so much as to perform as beautifully as one can, and in doing so, to shine a light on what it means to be human." Close quote. It's as if sport helps people get good things. You know, even all these observers I'm able to quote, it's as if sports writers, when they think about it, are able to absorb some of the good, healthy, uh, implicit values in the realm. Okay. Now, I'm still in uh, 4A, okay? The ethos of sport I'd like to talk about a little bit. The larger belief in the background of my discussion here, what I've been saying, is the simple thought that our, you know, the culture, the ethos you're around, that matters. The ideas, attitudes, modes of action that surround a person can influence his thinking about appropriate norms and standards. Certainly in regard to children, we commonly worry about the company they keep and what might rub off on them, right? We worry about the character of the friends they're hanging out with or uh, the work ethic of classmates at a particular school. But not only for children, for everyone, we know that things like a company culture or an office climate can influence people's attitudes and behavior, right? About adequate levels of work, for instance, or acceptable types of humor. Without even thinking about it, individuals give cues and infer standards. Subconscious modeling is natural. Well, the ethos of sport is essentially, and I only mean essentially, but it is essentially, I think, a healthy one. While we frequently hail the importance of positive role models for young people, sport beams many of the traits that nourish human flourishing. It provides salutary forms of life modeling, you might say, no, you know, role modeling, life modeling. And it's not the sp that special, the, I'm sorry, it is not that the specialized skills of catching or kicking bring benefit beyond the playing fields, right? Life isn't a rodeo, even after all these years in Texas. But the traits that underwrite these performances, right? The discipline, the dedication, the self-confidence, and so on, these transmit constructive messages about how to lead a successful life. Sports ethos of better is beneficial because life requires growth, the forward driving achievement of values. When a person does not see better as possible, as within uh, you know, his reach, he will not do the things that he must to advance his life. The point here is simply that hope, grounded hope, Rational optimism, as Jerome was speaking about a few days ago, that's critical to rational value pursuit. Now, none of what I've said so far is to try to urge that we see values where they are not, where they don't exist, right? Some games are, in, in sports, some games are very ho-hum. Many performances are ordinary. And we certainly witness an ugly assortment of contemptible behavior, which I'll comment on a little bit further later on, okay? As a domain of human activity, however, sport offers a great deal of healthy modeling. To appreciate the value of this realm that regularly offers admirable displays, we need only contrast prevalent attitudes in the world around us. Right? In our society, the vogue is a rather dim view of one's fellow men. Polls report abysmal levels of trust and respect for political leaders, the courts, the military, the media, universities, religious institutions. Individuals' views of one another have become increasingly caustic. They seem to range between suspicious and hostile. 
I mean, it is an era of snark as well, as was referred to the other day. Commentators describe ours as a cynical age, as if stating the self-evident. Bad faith is a given. Both of those lines from the New York Times, just again, stated as matter of fact. The news delivers an ongoing stream of unadmirable characters. The financial scammer exposed, the public official abusing the public funds, the prep school teacher molesting students, the moralizing preacher revealed as a philanderer, the racist hanging nooses in the playground, the terrorist detonating bombs or driving trucks into crowds, right? Our daily discourse revolves around failures, scandals, shame, malevolence. Now to be sure, people's attitudes are not wholly cynical. We still do award prizes. We give out the Pulitzers, right? We have the Oscars. We salute the valedictorian. Periodically, we even celebrate a seeming hero, right? The, uh, the special ops forces who pulled off a daring mission, the airline pilot who averts disaster at JFK. But almost as frequently, a chorus swells to sour the celebration as the sophisticated remind us that everybody has feet of clay and that the backstory is rarely innocent. He came up with an innovative design, eh, he had help. She led the research on that fantastic medical breakthrough, eh, she had favors. He, whatever, it doesn't matter, he's a child of privilege, right? The wisdom in the air is don't idolize, you will be disappointed. The seemingly admirable never stands up on closer inspection. And those who do accomplish significant things are scolded, you didn't build that, right? With the accusatory insinuation, you couldn't possibly. No one is that capable. Well, in sport, the evidence of accomplishment is on the field, plain, before our eyes. It shows, well, yeah, he did, which sends the message, you can build something good. So my point is simply, against this cultural background, sport, through its regular displays of admirable feats, provides refuge. The regular occasion for admiration that sport provides serves as an antidote to the acidic fault-finding and constriction of vision that we often encounter in other realms. In the universe of sport, the bulk of attention is directed to the good performances. Winners get more press. Not every game dis uh, furnishes superlative displays, yet the sports world the sports world's orbit tilts relentlessly positive. The ethos of sport is soaked in success. Energy is driven toward excellence. It's an atmosphere of achievement. Even when commentators and fans analyze what went wrong, when we second guess and critique, it's for the sake of improvement. The whole enterprise is oriented around performing well, as well as one can. Sport's heartbeat is the drive to be better, premised on the conviction that we can be. This is what motivates even very highly successful athletes, uh, you know, people who've really succeeded in the past. This is why the Tom Brady is still coming up with new training and fitness and dietary strategies to be ever better, right? It's conventional wisdom in sport that the complacent will rot. Sport prizes ambition, as I was saying earlier, right? Openly displayed, unapologetically embraced. Here again, contrast, in most contexts, saying I want my company to be big or I want to make $10 billion would be regarded as crass. Again, not at an objectivist conference, but in most contexts, realistically, right? Ooh, that's crass, you know. Yet, for a tennis player to express her desire to be number one or a team of defeated finalists to declare second isn't good enough, we want to be champions? Oh, what does that elicit? Yeah, right on, brother. That's the right way to, to think about it, right? We criticize the player who seems satisfied with anything less than the crown. The quest to excel is part of what sport is. The culture of sport exudes hope and positive prospects. The visible display of athletes' achievements vindicates that hope for it routinely shows dreams rewarded. Even during the longest droughts for one's own favorite teams or players, if you have them, fans witness others' dreams realized, right? It's insistently can-do culture um, demonstrates that even the unlikeliest can be done because it is done, as we see, right? 
the Boston Red Sox finally won the series, right, after 86 years. And Boston fans, you're allowed to, even now, you know. <laughs> I meant here and now. Don't we have any Red Sox fans here? <laughs> Come on. Hey, that's great. We thought that would never happen. And you got... And look, wait a second, it's not just them. See also, as our academic writing would have it, you know, see also the 2016 Chicago Cubs. Come on, Chicago. <laughs> see also the 2016 Cleveland Cavaliers, et cetera. <laughs> uh, no, but, but uh, et cetera, et cetera, many, many glorious, et cetera, right? The unthinkable, yeah, it happens. Okay, so now moving on a little bit further. Thus far, I've canvassed what the admirable in sport displays. Beyond simply showing impressive feats, however, it's important to appreciate admiration's potential to influence action. So this is 4B, if you're following on the handout, okay? 4B, how it influences action. It's natural to think that the expression of admiration can be encouraging to its recipient, the person admired. What also transpires, however, is that admiration benefits the admirer, right? Witnessing others' admirable accomplishments sends one's subconscious the message, difficult things are doable. We are capable of doing them. Admiration enhances a person's sense of the world he lives in and of human capacity. It can thereby encourage the person to take more life-advancing actions himself. It can motivate a person to strive for his values. Others' accomplishments reflect well on the species. And just as self-esteem is vital equipment for a person's developing appropriate levels of ambition in terms of goal setting, risk taking, and so on, so species esteem is a strengthening supplement for full self-esteem requires some quotient of esteem for the kind of thing that one is. Admiration of the accomplishments of others contributes to feeling pride in one's humanity. And if personal pride bespeaks love of self and a commitment to making oneself and one's life the best they can be, so human prize, uh, pride, you know, pride in being human, can energize the sense, this being human, this is a great thing to be, right? I mean, we can do cool things. I want to do them too. In short, admiration fuels ambition. Looking up encourages aiming up, aiming higher in one's pursuits. Now, obviously, the correlation is not causal necessity. An individual human motivation is very complicated. Action results from a host of interlocking factors, primarily that person's own choices. Commonly, however, experiencing things that we admire feeds the conviction that sought results can be won and bolsters a person's own motivation. My basic proposal here is that admiration fosters ambition and constructive action. Writers contemplating the arts have sometimes noted the salubrious power of admiration. Goethe remarked of his encounter with a particular sculpture, the, um, it was a fifth century unattributed sculpture, the Medusa Rond Rondanini, okay? But Goethe, Goethe remarked of his encounter with this piece, quote, the mere knowledge that such a work could be created makes me feel twice the person I was. Close quote. A contemporary novelist, Wendy Lesser, claims that the grandeur of literature makes us believe, quote, in the superhuman capacities of human beings. And we all need to feel this at times. Literary grandeur gives us something to admire, and admiration is a feeling we cannot live without. Close quote. Think about Dagny at the first run of the John Galt line. And I give you this passage on the handout. I'm only going to read a part of what I gave you on the handout. But Dagny, at the first run of the John Galt line, among other things, reflects, the sight of an achievement is the greatest gift a human being could offer to others. The reason that human beings enjoy witnessing impressive success is that we all must succeed to live. Success, in principle, is good for us. We survive by success. Moreover, we survive by knowing that it is possible. 
Witnessing others' successes, again, shows us that it is. We stand on the shoulders of giants, not only materially, but spiritually. And here I call your attention to the beloved scene from the fountainhead of the boy on the bicycle. And I've given you a lot of that on the handout. I don't give you all of it on the handout, and I'm going to read now even a little bit less than that. But think about that scene, and let me read from it. The boy is thinking, don't help me or serve me, but let me see the promise of that music is what he has in mind. Because I need it. Don't work for my happiness, my brothers. Show me yours. Show me that it is possible. Show me your achievement, and the knowledge will give me courage for mine. And a little bit further down, he says to Rourke, that isn't real, is it? The boy asked, pointing down. Why, yes, it is now, the man answered. It's not a movie set or a trick of some kind? No, it's a summer resort. It's just been completed. It will be opened in a few weeks. Who built it? I did. What's your name? Howard Rourke. Thank you, said the boy. He knew that the steady eyes looking at him understood everything these two words had to cover. Howard, Cli Howard Rourke inclined his head in acknowledgement. Finally then, apart from the instrumental value that it might have, admiration is enjoyable for C. In a certain way, this is my favorite part of it. I'm just a pleasure seeker and I like enjoyment and I think we all should uh, foresee. Admiration is valuable in part because of the pleasure of the experience. Think for a moment about the feel of admiration in any realm, right, when you admire something. Think about the feel of it, not its cognitive components or its underlying premises, but its texture as you experience it. When a person is in the grip of genuinely admiring something, it feels clean, pure, right. For contrast, consider a reaction of disgust or even simply strong disapproval, right? You tend to feel diminished by that encounter, right? The reaction to what someone has done, for instance, oh, he really shouldn't have done that. Jonathan, oh, that was no good. That was really poor. Right? It feels as if it shrinks one a little or as if it shrinks the world, constricting its possibilities. Admiration feels expansive, widening one's sense of what we are and of the good that we can do. The fact that we are sometimes lost for words in admiration, that attempts to articulate one's experience, dissolve into the primitive, wow. That only testifies to the displays straining one's previous conceptions of the possible. At its height, admiration, and again, I'm talking here about admiration broadly, not just in the athletic realm, right? At its heights, the admiration overpowers us. It ravishes me with its perfection, as one writer put it. This is a good feeling. The boy on the bicycle may be inspired by Rourke's achievement, and that's fabulous, but I think he also simply enjoys it. In looking for that moment, he is content. Witnessing another's achievement, particularly of that magnitude, right, it polishes his universe. A related Ayn Rand passage I just came upon again this morning. Um, that one, she writes, that one should wish to enjoy the contemplation of values, of the good, is self-explanatory. Moreover, one of the things that we witness in sport is other people's enjoyment. And that itself is usually enjoyable, right? Human beings seem to harbor a native affection for other human beings' delight, right? We like it when the baby smiles. Ooh, look, he's smiling now, right? Doesn't that make you smile? And scientists have found some evidence that smiles are contagious. I don't think that they've definitively proved this yet, but why well, yeah. Now, of course, this is one step removed from admiration for achievements of the players. Yet part of the exhilarating atmosphere of spectator sports is supplied by the experience of the others with whom we share it. Seeing their elation is a rare opportunity to witness unadulterated, unguarded joy. Consider 
a not uncommon experience for the sports fan, particularly those of us who didn't grow up with the technologies where you can just quickly on your phone check the score, right? You know what we used to do? We used to turn on television. You do know television, everybody, the younger people? Television, right? So that was our source, right? You'd turn on television when you thought the sports news was gonna be broadcast and you'd try to find out the score. But frequent occurrence, you'd turn on the, you know, and you, you'd turn it on and that, at that moment they were, they were showing scenes of some major triumph, you know, a championship just clinched of some team that you don't care about, you know, or in some sport that you don't care about. But you're watching the fans, the, you know, adulation, the, I'm sorry, the jubilation, now, it could be a sport you could not care less about. You know, Middle Tennessee State has won the Women's College Softball Championship. I'm very happy for those people. You know, it just doesn't do it for me. Or Wolverhampton has upset Stoke-on-Trent. All right. It doesn't matter what they're showing, right? What the screen unfurls, right, of these happy, triumphant people, the leaps in the air, the open-armed racing to embrace teammates, the watermelon-wide smiles, the eyes, the eyes of, can you believe it, delirium. It makes you smile, right? That reaction seems beyond your control. You can't help but feel good. The sight of human happiness gives you a bounce. It feels as if, yeah, yeah, this is the way it's supposed to feel. Now, some might object that that is not exactly something to admire and these people are called killjoys. <laughs> but, no, I mean, in one sense, that's certainly true. Others' pleasure itself is a reaction to admirable achievements. Yet, it is emphatically something to relish others' happiness, right? It's part of the payoff of the qualities and performances that we do admire. And in a further sense, I think some happiness certainly is admirable. Earned satisfaction at difficult challenges bespeaks an accomplishment. The reason that we seek to accomplish demanding goals is the belief that attaining those goals will make life better, that we want to enjoy that. Relishing the enjoyment is an indirect way of honoring the accomplishment. And it's what the accomplishment is for. What's also unusual is that in sport, one is allowed, you know, sort of socially allowed to feel such satisfaction openly. At the office, marking a success by doing a jig makes you seem like an attention-seeking jerk, right? I mean, if you... But in a, the public spectacle of sport, visible emotional reactions to ups and downs are accepted as perfectly normal. And our acceptance of the public exhibition seems... To, I'm sorry, and our acceptance of their public exhibition seems to sanction the legitimacy of those responses. The undisguised embrace of joy in particular implies that it is good to be joyous. And you know, we don't get that much, right? We don't get that response very often. Permission to be happy, to enjoy something you want just because you wanted Middle Tennessee State to prevail, right? So my principal point here, again, is this. One of the values that admiration offers is the sheer pleasure it provides. Admiration of worthy athletic accomplishments is deeply enjoyable. So let me recap now this value portion of the discussion. I've argued that athletic admiration is valuable for what it shows, for what it stimulates, and for the pleasure of the experience. Admiration is an upper. It at once feels good and can fuel good by strengthening a person's understanding of what is possible and what he correspondingly can strive for. In all realms, focus on the admirable buoys one's knowledge that good things are a real part of the universe we inhabit and that it is open to us to bring further good things into our lives. As such, admiration can be a source of optimism and a prod to constructive action. More simply, it allows one to linger in the afterglow of greatness. It's a line from yet another author. Okay, let me take a few minutes to address a couple of potential objections, and, and then I'll conclude. There is a written version of this lecture, by the way, in which I address four objections, and even these two at greater length. But let me just quickly uh, address a couple here. 
The most obvious complaint that I would see some people having is, look, you're offering a highly selective portrait, Tara. You're really cherry picking aspects that are admirable, yet you'd have to be blind not to see much to condemn in sport, right? We frequently observe incidents of crass immodesty, child among athletes, particularly at the, particularly at the pro levels, uh, childish self-absorption, arrogance, whining, and entitlement mentality, callous disrespect sometimes for teammates and opponents, let alone off the field episodes of misogyny and physical violence. Far from being admirable, such behavior deserves our censure. Well, yes, I agree entirely. But this doesn't pose a problem for my central contention here, right? My claim is not that sport is exclusively admirable, presenting nothing but commendable displays. Rather, my claim has been much of the appeal of sport, much of its genuine value, rests in all that it offers to admire, to salute. That sport does not unfailingly deliver these things doesn't cancel the fact that it regularly does. Justice, certain, you know, practicing the virtue of justice, that certainly requires candid confrontation with the unseemly thing that uh, athletes and associated people sometimes do, as well as with the good. We need to be clear-eyed about the sorts of behavior that undercut a healthy culture in sport. Uh, I've gone into this more in other writings. So again, none of what I'm commending here calls for sugarcoating or disguising or ignoring the vile things that particular people in athletics do. I'm simply calling for us to recognize the underappreciated value that sport offers, the, namely the likely encounter of the admirable. The poor behavior of some does not erase the plenitude of the good. While we can readily find examples of bad behavior in all fields, athletics included, and while the media certainly milk these, you know, such incidents, as Frank Bruni again put it, we should not let the language of complaint supplant the language of wonder. End of quote. Uh, so yes, bad behavior is lamentable in sport, at times despicable, and it should be called as such, but it doesn't diminish the value of the good. Okay. A second different objection. This revolves around the relative insignificance of sport. And I should say here too, by giving you some passages from artists or even from an artwork itself, the fountainhead, I am not trying to put on equal footing uh, you know, the accomplishment of stealing third under pressure and what Rourke did or things like that, okay? I'm not equating all of it. I'm just talking about admiration in different fields and trying to get at the value of admiration, all right? But some might be concerned, reasonably, about the relative insignificance of sport. The inconsequential character of athletic pursuits, that might seem to undercut the value of admiration here. I mean, what's at stake, after all, is excellence at play, right? An artificial arena of frivolous pursuit. Doesn't true admiration, one might think, doesn't that require a certain degree of gravity in the object admired? Doesn't its value require a minimal threshold of weight? Sport, one might think, simply doesn't rise to that level. That's not a knock on sport, but simply an observation about its value as a forum for admiration. Even if impressive athletic performances carry some value, it can't be much given the insignificance of the stakes. Well, I think there are certainly elements of truth in this. They don't add up again to a refutation of what I've been arguing. No question. Compared to more consequential challenges that people face in real life, sport is relatively trivial. Yet, athletic achievements, modest impact on material well-being do, do not diminish, or impact does not diminish the value that they provide. So a few clarifications, which I hope will help. First, we admire things that we regard as good, as unusually well done. To admire something is not to imply that it is the greatest good in the galaxy. Admirers should be mindful of the exact value held by the objects of their esteem. Proportionality and context should always restrain our, or constrain our evaluations. Second, sport presents human, human beings doing things that are hard to do. The levels of competition that are most admired, the contests are difficult, the opponents are skilled, and the constituent activities demanding. 
The stakes, in many respects, are low, as the games are created largely for the purpose of recreation and amusement. Prowess at shooting a basketball or controlling a puck with a stick, right? What the hell is a puck, right? Yeah, that won't increase crop yield or boost a medicine's effectiveness, yet to be good at the things that sport demands is to perform difficult feats, and you know, to be especially good at them in an exemplary way. And this feeds into my third point in response here. Remember that it is not solely athletic abilities that we admire, but also the deeper character traits often ev evidenced, the intelligence, the self-discipline, level-headedness, persistence, and so on. While the traits that players exhibit in their athletic careers do not necessarily carry over in other areas of life, right? I'm not using this to predict who, you know, who will perform the best in other areas. We're simply responding to what is good in what has been done by these people, okay? So in sum here, a few related points. Athle athletics stakes are not entirely trivial, although the outcome of a given game typically is. For things other than that outcome are in play. The traits admired are not confined to the realm of sport. Insofar as successes occur within the artificial sphere of sport, they don't feed or cure, but they exhibit human abilities, sometimes in glorious form. And while human abilities can be directed toward ends that are either momentous or mundane, noble or ignoble, it is ability that human beings need in order to accomplish any good Consequently, the display of ability, particularly at levels that arouse positive admiration, can be a reminder of what man's capable of, and they can be an inspiration to strive oneself. I'm going to conclude, but uh, I want to plant a few possible questions for the question period, if I may, and you don't have to pick up the, the seeds, but I did um, just, I think yesterday, encounter Another note I had made, it's a brief passage from Fountainhead on admiration. If anybody wants to ask, I can read you that brief passage. Okay, it's not, it made it, it's not on the handout. The handout went to press a few weeks ago. Second, I've got a trivia question on baseball uh, about the uh, LA Dodgers, if anybody is interesting. And third, I've got a new game that I'm gonna play this fall. It's not a sport, but it concerns sport. And uh, I'd love to tell you about Win One for Reason, my new game that I'm going to play this fall, and I invite you to play with me. So you might want to ask me about one or more of those three things. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and I told that laugher over there, and if they don't ask me about the quote, that's the one I said. You know, make, I like that atlas. I'm sorry, the fountainhead quote. Anyway. <coughs> Admiration is selfish. To admire worthy objects is in your interest. My focus has been on the pleasure and value of witnessing the admirable in sport, right? The value for the admirer. Just as justice, as those of you who've studied justice in some depth understand, just as justice is beneficial not only for those who are judged objectively and treated accordingly, but for the just person himself, so admiration is beneficial for you, the admirer. Now given this, it would be natural to wonder, so should a person seek out occasions to experience admiration? Should everybody become a sports fan? Is that the message? Well, now already at the beginning, I tried to say, no, I'm not trying to say everybody should become a sports fan. Uh, this is not eat your spinach, you know, go to a game. But I would, I would say, be alert to the admirable wherever you encounter it. Be woke to the world of good of man-made good things, of human beings' achievements. They brighten your life, spiritually. I encourage you to admire, not as a duty, but as a pleasure, as an enhancer. In contemporary society, again, I hate to bring it up, but we encounter much to look down upon. We look askance at many other things, and we look away from the sordidness of still others. Sport offers considerable occasion for looking up. Admiration of fine performances underscores human ability and human potential. Recognizing that potential, you know, just recognizing it, wow, the potential, is a first step toward exploiting it, toward striving, toward stretching ourselves, toward realizing it. The physical demonstration of difficult things that we can accomplish is an inspiration 
Watching, and that's what sport gives you, watching a world in which such things are doable and done can energize a person's own ambition, giving him more reason to try and reason to want. It makes dreams sensible and seeds the action that fulfills them. Beyond this inspirational value, sports, value, uh, sports display of admirable accomplishments is worthwhile in its own right. It offers a sanctuary that's agreeable to inhabit and an affirmation of living. Uh, Nick Hornby is a devoted Arsenal fan in British Premier Soccer. He wrote, I think, a lovely memoir about his fandom. And he's on to something, Hornby, when he observes that being a fan is not a vicarious pleasure. In triumph, the joy that fans feel is not a celebration of others' good fortune, but a celebration of our own." Close quote. And I concur. When we root for our heroes, you go, Roger, this week at Wimbledon, right? You go, Ronaldo. We're not, we're not just rooting for them. We're rooting on us. We're rooting on life. So let me close with a confession. Well, you, know, you go through this as an academic. I'm sure the other academics in particular here will uh, identify. They may not have such frivolous interests. But I certainly, you know, uh, you know, then again, they might not. But, uh, you know, before I undertook this paper, I really struggled for a while to justify devoting time to it. I mean, shouldn't I be writing about more serious matters than sport? Uh, isn't that a duty? I thought I, I could have sworn I saw that in the objectivist catechism. Um, <laughs> ultimately, I accepted, look, you have a modest thesis. I recognize this is something of a feel-good piece. But in certain respects, this paper is far from modest. Its ostensible thesis is an underappreciated reward of spectator sport is the occasion for admiration, which itself is a real value. And I think that, I mean, by saying it's, a, I mean, that is my thesis. I think that's true. I hope I've given you good reason to believe that too. But at the same time, in a way, that's just a cover. Uh, what this paper is really saying is admiration is good. Because goodness, in all of its different forms, is good. Because life is good. Now, how do you prove that? You can't prove it, right? It's too elemental. So despite these professions of modesty, even at this stage, one might ask, oh, come on, Tara, isn't this all a little bit over the top? <laughs> to which I can only respond, yes, it is. Because I think life is over the top. I'm a fan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hook 'em horns. Thank you. And that's not even a Texan. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes. Uh, can you compare the admiration for fictional characters in literature with uh, admiration for athletes? It's an interesting question. You can certainly compare the two. I wouldn't put them on the same par. Uh, they're, they're very different in certain fairly obvious respects, right? Um, the athlete is real. In real life, he did what he did. The fictional character is fictional. It represent, you know, it can represent, I mean, God knows the best characters in fiction, mm -hmm. what they show us in a different way, right, through the thinking of the author, right, through the imagination and then the credibility of the story and the character and everything. What they show is even grander, I think, and even more valuable in many ways than what a certain kind of athlete can show. I, and I do think it's worth thinking about, meaning I think there are probably things to be learned about the arts and about sports and about values in general from posing the kind of question that would ask, well, what are the similarities between the value of the arts and the value of sports, and what are the differences? But I have not done that much at all yet. 
Um, actually, I shouldn't say yet, because I don't particularly plan anytime soon to do it. I will say, I do have one article, which is available, and I give you the reference to it on the handout. I have an article that's about some of the similarities and differences between art and sport, and it's freely available online. It, it's a Spanish lang language publication, but if you scroll down a little bit, it is in English, the article. I don't speak Spanish. But um, I do want to say about that article, it's, I, please treat it as food for thought. I'm not at all sure that I got everything right in that article. It's not that there are specific things I got wrong, but you know, sometimes it's like you still have, mm, I'm not sure I got that right. And this is largely because aesthetics is hard. And when you talk about the arts, it's hard. But if you just treated it as, well, this will be some more specificity about things we might consider in regard to the similarities and differences between the arts and sports, you might look at that piece. It's, uh, Thank you. Something to behold. That's the piece if you're looking for it on the handout. You talked uh, a little bit about this in your section on triviality, but I've heard people say something like, oh, you know, we all are, you know, the culture is so obsessed with these sports players uh, who were really kind of just uh, uh, acting in this kind of physical world. What if we had don't we wish that the sports, you know, we had sports pages that followed scientists and, and you know, other innovators. Yeah. And I wonder if you think that, I'm a little skeptical actually that that's possible, that sort of sports is special to be tracked this way. Although as I was thinking about this question, I also thought, is the stock market and the way that we watch financial news kind of that for businesses? Uh, well, no, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think two, two things occurred to me. The main thing is what I think makes sports so easy to track and follow and get into in this way is it's physical, visible displays. What people in other fields do is far more impressive, but it's hard to understand what the hell that, you know, like you need specialized advanced knowledge to understand what the neuroscientists are doing and what the nanotechnologists are doing, right? And these genetic uh, therapy advances and so on. That's too much to comprehend for the non right? Whereas, you know, sports gives a kind of low common denominator, right? But it's like you can watch the game, right? You're seeing the visible, physical displays of, you understand the goal of the game, you understand the purpose, this is what the shortstop's supposed to do, and you watch, and it's either done or not done, so it's contained in that way. But even if you think of something like, not the sport, but the game of chess, that's pretty impressive, but I don't understand. You know, I can't <laughs> see it in the same way that I can see, ah, you know, out at the plate or whatever. Well, you know, and, and again, I think the common, I'm sorry, you know, I referred to the lowest common denominator thing. It, it's a more universal language. We can see, you know, we're all watching the World Cup soccer, or at least many people, right? Um, so that's part of it. What was the other thing I was going to do? Oh, yeah. In a sense, too, just vis-a-vis -vis politics, and I mean, people get into the horse race aspect of politics or to some extent, I guess, the stock market, right? But we have such vast differences, right, all over the world and in the country about our political views. There's a, even the most rabid sports fans, well, maybe not all of the most rabid, but a lot <laughs> of the most rabid sports <laughs> fans understand this is a game, right? This isn't setting government policy. So it's as if, in their subconscious at least, they understand that this isn't do or die in the same way, such that I think it, that encourages people to just celebrate and enjoy their, uh, you know, their enjoyment of sport. Yes. Hello, Ms. Smith. Um, my question is on the concept of pride. And I wrote this one down, so I got it right. Uh, Ms. Rand defined pride in the for new, the new intellectual quote, Pride is a recognition of the fact that you are your own highest value, and like all of man's values, it has to be earned. That if any achievements open to you, the one that makes all other possible is the creation of your own character, close quote. It reminded me of an essay she wrote of Living Death, where she also said, quote, to a rational man in regards to sex, sex is an expression of self-esteem, now in italics, a celebration of himself and of existence. When she wrote this, I realized that she wrote of existence, not his existence. It occurred to me that this isn't just a celebration of his life, but also of his partners as well. My question is, can there be pride in another individual? Mutual selfishness in sex, as I think Ms. Gorlin would say, can there be mutual selfishness in pride? 
It's a very interesting question. Um, a well, a little complicated, so I shouldn't, uh, there's a long line, so I shouldn't go into it too much, but two things. Um, there's actually a passage in Atlas Shrugged in which, I forget if it's either Dagny or Hank, or I forget if it's from one of their perspectives, but Ayn Rand talks about the response in sex as a kind of, she brings up admiration in talking about that affirmation of one's deepest values and finding it in another person. So she connects admiration with that mutual, you know, enjoyment in sex. Um, there's this, there's this a definitely a legitimate sense of taking pride in another, particularly when one has played some role in the development of that other person or in the accomplishment and so on, right? And even, even that gets more complicated. I might talk, I forget if I do, I have an article on pride. I have a chapter in my book on pride, which is similar to the article, but probably goes into this more. I probably address that in there a little bit. Um, you know, I can't be, there's one certain, I mean, there's an obvious sense in which I can't be proud of things that you can be proud of that you've done because I don't know you, I didn't meet you until this, you know, I saw you here this week, so I can't take some pride in that. A parent might be able to take, might be able to take pride in some of a child's accomplishments if he had some instrumental or contributory role in that, right? Um, I, I feel a kind of awe, an uncomfortable pride. I'm so proud of Lisa Van Dam, but I wish I could really claim pride for it because she was my student at UT. But, um, but she already knew about objectivism, so I, you know, there's a sense of, I can't take pride, you know, but there's, I'm proud, but I mean, more than that, it's like, wow, she's great, I, you know, it's not just by any means, it's more like I want to get her stuff. I'm sorry, now I'm, I'm babbling. Um, <laughs> no, but I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more about pride after the lecture, if you want, because it is a, certainly a very good question, but the primary thing uh, to focus on with pride is making yourself, your life, the best it can be. To the ex yeah, yeah, okay, let me stop there. Thank you. Sure. You're a very misbehaved question, Ru. I gave you three. <laughs> Free will. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, do you want to hit us with the Dodgers trivia? Oh, um, thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> and if you want another one, too, if you weren't going to ask that. Um, anybody know where the Dodgers got their name? You do? Good for you. I'm sorry? Charlie Dodgers. Dodging subways, I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah dodging cars. I had no idea. Uh, I only read this a few weeks ago that the Dodgers, because of course they were originally the Brooklyn Dodgers, that's significant, right? First I read good at dodging traffic, and then I looked into it a little bit and I heard, well, they were the trolley Dodgers. They were, that may not have been their formal name, but that was the def uh, derivation of it. They were evidently very good New Yorkers at dodging traffic. So it's trivia. I said it's trivia. Thank you. All right, this will be a bit more sobering. Um, as a fan of American football, how do you grapple with and assess the emerging concerns about brain trauma? Yeah. Um, as a fan of American football, how do you, the question was, how do you deal with the um, emerging evidence about trauma to the brain from some of the injuries? You know, it's really, it's been coming out a lot in the last few years. Well, all I can say is, I've been grappling with it increasingly. I mean, I am a fan of American football. Um, and I'll just be quick here. Um, I really think they need to change the rules to make the game safer, right? In any sport, in terms of, you know, should I let my kids play this sport or that sport or whatever, anything you let your kids do, right? You've always got to think about what are the risks, how, li how likely is, you know, the kind of injury. What is at stake? What would it be an injury to, potentially, and how serious is that? And well, the brain, the brain in particular, right, from concussions or sustained impact, even if not at the concussion level and all. What we're learning changes the context. Um, and believe me, I've been thinking about this even more in anticipation of this talk, um, and thinking we do need to, we fans, need to exert more pressure, you know, if we care about this, um, need to exert more pressure to change the rules to make it safer. 
Because an important premise of sport, and I only realized this very recently as I th thought about it a little bit further, it's like the premise of an, even enjoying it as a fan is that this is basically a, you know, a good activity, harmless in a certain sense. Well, that harmless, that's changing that. No, it's not, of course, there's always in risks in any sport and so on and so on, but the level of, I mean, what we're talking about, the mind, I mean, that's at the, you know, that's what it's all about. Um, so it gets harder to support it as a fan, and I'm really thinking, okay, I've got to become more active in opposing uh, or fostering change in it. Thanks. Uh, my question concerns the differences I think exist between uh, admiring an individual athlete versus admiring a team. I'm from New York. I think there are a good number of New Yorkers who followed Tiger Woods' career and now wish him well or wondering, can he, can he get back to in stride? What's he, what's he going to do next? A genuine admiration and concern. Uh, on the other hand, if you turn to, say, baseball in New York, 99% of the baseball fans are either Mets fans or Yankee fans. Very, very few, I would think, Minnesota Twins fans. It seems to be local for reasons that uh, I would guess are extraneous to the sport itself. Do you think that's uh, healthy and reasonable, or do you think that kind of fandom is a degraded form of fandom, the locality? Okay, yeah, that's an interesting distinction. I don't think it's degraded in any way. I think it's very natural. I think I talk about this a little bit in the, the essay, actually I gave a lecture at an Ocon a couple of years ago on fa a different aspect of fandom, and I think I talk about it a little bit in there, but I think it's perfectly fine to, to follow the local team and to be a fan of the local team. It's perfectly natural. In a way, it's of a piece with the wider context being this isn't about, you know, political stakes or something like that. It, it's just an entertainment and amusement and around here and where you're going to get the best press coverage of your team and so on. And the locality can also um, foster a certain kind of camaraderie to be among fellow fans, which is part of what one enjoys and might value about the sport. At the same time, if one's team does things that one has serious problems with, you know, or has a certain kind of player or coach or, uh, you know, is exposed as cheating in certain ways and so on. That's reason to not support that team as much. Easier said than done, I know. Like if you're really, no, but I, I understand. I was raised a New York Giants fan and it is in my blood and it's hard to um, even contemplate letting go of that as I've begun to contemplate, you know, in the last year or two vis-a-vis -vis the last question and the, the violence and injuries that result. A few other, just a few other additions. Um, even if you admire the local teams, right, you can all, or follow and root for the local teams, you can identify things you admire on different grounds about, I really like that coach in Cleveland, you know, or whatever it might be, right? I really, no, I like what he's doing there. I'd like them to succeed, as long as it's not hurting the home team, right, my team, right? But, but to a great extent and a greater extent, your contrast with individual sports, golfers, tennis players, et cetera, one often responds not on the basis of, oh, he's an American player, but I like these qualities in Nadal or in Federer or Djokovic or whatever it might be, because it is clearly a more individually, you know, there's more to, you get to know more about the individual there and that's a, a basis, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, Ms. Smith, uh, I was wondering if you had any comments on e-sports or electronic sports. Uh, so these are video games in which uh, players play against other players and while they're not as physically demanding as a uh, traditional sport, um, they still, I would argue, require the same sort of virtues as uh, a, a traditional sport would. Uh -huh. I really don't, and I say that because I haven't thought about it that much, but I'm aware of them, and I don't mean, I mean, I think it's a perfectly good question. It's an increasing question in the philosophy of sport these days. Well because a lot of things want to be called sports for different reasons, and there are some stakes that hinge on whether or not something qualifies as a sport by certain authorities and so on. But I just haven't thought through it all yet, the eSports thing. I haven't thought it through. I've thought about it a little, so I think I should stop there. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you.
but I think it's a good question and worth thinking about because it sharpens what exactly makes something a sport as opposed to, in the one case, the electronic, but there are going to be other things in between, you know, like when I said chess is not a sport, there are people clamoring to have chess considered a sport and be an Olympic competition and so on. Okay, thanks. Hi, I have a question about uh, the nearest relatives of the idea of admirable sports. So, for example, you could say that some games of chance aren't really admirable, and perhaps you could... Did you say aren't or are? Aren't. Aren't. Like, for example, yeah. Like, uh, roulette, for example, isn't really a game of uh, worthy of admiration, I would say, but perhaps poker, on the other hand, would require more skill. And perhaps you can say the same on um, games where you have to fight. So, for example, boxing includes a lot of rules. But when I see those cage matches and MMA fights, I don't really think that it's too violent for me. Uh -huh. So where would you say but the borders are? Okay, but there's a difference between a question of is it a sport and is it a good sport or a sport that I think it's a good thing that people follow and you know, pursue and encourage, right? Um, so those are two different questions. Uh, on whether or not certain things are sports, the physicality of the demands, to some extent, they differ a lot in different sports, golf versus rugby, okay? I mean, there are different levels of physical exertion, but it is more physical than chess. Now, there are, you know, there are borderlines, and a lot of thinking goes into successful, very physical. I mean, even, you know, football, there's a lot of thinking that goes into the play calling, the defenses, and so on. Um, so it's not that it's one or the other. You know, it's your mind working, doing it all, or it's your body doing it all. Um, and I don't know how to exactly draw the line. Again, that's not, since that's not really the, t even though it's in the sport realm, it's not my focus here, so I don't think I'll say more right now. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions. The first one is, uh, could you expound on the reason Thank contest? Thank you. Thank you very much. So here's my, my game. Um, win one for reason. Every time a team, like let's say, and I'll use the example of football, but this is definitely adaptable in other areas. Okay, so heads up, pay attention, everybody. Um, but what I'm going to play this fall is what I'm calling win one for reason. Every time the New York Giants win, I'm pledging a small amount of money to ARI. <laughs> win one for reason, right? And every time, and somebody's taking notes from development, right? Um, <laughs> The Texas Longhorns win, this is just football, okay? Or the Virginia Cavaliers, that's my alma mater, ACC team, okay? So anytime any one of those three teams wins in the regular season or the postseason, should they get to the postseason, you have to be clear about the rules, right? Um, or if they're in a bowl game at the college, you know, I'll give a certain amount of money to ARI. Isn't that great? And it's not gambling. It's not gambling. Well, first of all, gambling is legal now in sports, right? But it's not gambling because your team wins, ARI wins. Your team loses, I don't owe anybody any money, right? This is good. <laughs> so you can adapt this. Baseball, you might not want to every game, you know, give them $20, but every, X, every five games, every 10 games, every time Tiger reaches Saturday, or whatever they call it in golf after the first, right? Or every time Roger Federer reaches the quarterfinals, or, you know, adapt as you like, hockey fans, whatever, okay? It could be $10 a game, $20 a game, $30 a game. I did this last year for Shakespeare, for my partner's Shakespeare. I said, I said win one for, for the Bard. And you know, all my teams had mediocre, but it still added up to a few hundred bucks, so. Thank you very much for the question. Yes. I, I anticipate a lot of donations on behalf of the Giants this year. You, you don't? I, I, a lot. Oh, you do? Yes. You're hopeful about, well, so we should very talk much. later. Okay, <laughs> good. Very, <laughs> Sorry. very much. Well, you know, the running back, the first, the cho and you know, new coach, God knows we need that, but now the GM um, has cancer, has, yeah, so. <laughs> um, I, I've thought about sports uh, extensively, played on several teams and received accolades in, in high school uh, for for the most part, for, for my ability as a teammate, for my, you know, being a good teammate. Good. Um, and I've thought about that. I thought about it while I was on the field, because I, I, never, I never did anything for a sacrificial aim. Uh, you know, I, I'd never thought of it that way. And when someone praised me for sacrifice, mm. it bothered me. And, and you see it in, um, in sports, particularly basketball is a place where you see it all the time where they praise someone for passing the ball and that they're unselfish. Yeah, right. And the, the rhetoric 
doesn't match the reality. The reality. Uh, do yeah. you have any thoughts on that? Let me, thank you. No, that's a good point. Someone else, one of the general speakers, I think this week even referred to this again. Teamwork is often, is usually misunderstood in sport. It's a wonderful, th no, a team sport requires team cooperation, everybody being on the same page that the objective is for the team to win, not for this individual player to be the most impressive to get a better contract, right? If you're playing a team sport in that context, it is often, I mean, the goal isn't for me to score the most, you know, or whatever, some, some in the relevant sport, right? Um, no, the goal is for the team to win, for the team to win, my role is to do you know, whatever, however I can best serve that. Sometimes it's taking the shot myself, sometimes it's passing the ball, et cetera. So it's really important to recognize the selfishness of collaborative activity. And there's nothing wrong with being in on such a collaborative activity, but it's not a sacrifice. It's, yeah, I want to win. You're, you're happy when your teammates do well because that's helping the team do well. Yeah, so that, that's a quick remark. Thank you. Thank you. And we are down to the final minutes of the question period, so. Yes. Uh, who do you admire in the field of sport and why? Why? That's a good question. It, and it, it, it'll vary depending on, you know, a certain era and, and so on. And I, in some ways I have very simplistic reasons for some of my um, admiration. I guess I, ad I, I, I like Roger Federer in tennis. I, Admire, here's the thing, you know, I don't always know a great deal about the player, and these days you're always very, it's like, well, I like, when you're first liking a player, it's like, well, I haven't heard anything bad about him yet, because people often do, you know, it's like, oh, then I hear that, or I see that display, and it's like, I'm not on with, you know, I'm not on board with that kind of thing. But he seems to be gracious in victory or defeat, and a gentleman, and those are some of the qualities that I like about him. I really admire, in various sports, signs of real intelligence, like, ooh, they were really thinking about that. And here I mean even in like a football, right? You gotta, it, I think, Peyton Manning, great quarterback, one of his chief assets was at the line of scrimmage, he could quickly really integrate the kind of de de uh, defense that was on the field and make, you know, in the moment, quick adjustments that were evidently, you know, from people who know more than I, Brilliant, I love that kind of thing, when you see the intelligence going with it. And I could go on about a few other, of the sorts of traits more than individuals, I guess. But isn't that a nice, like it gives you occasion to think more about the admired. And when you think more about it, you're prodded to identify more exactly what exactly you admire about them, which is great. Talk about a life enhancer. Hi, thank you for the talk. I sometimes see people refer to athletes who do extremely well as monsters or machines or they're inhuman or something, or terms along those lines. And I sometimes get the feeling that it sets the athlete apart from us normal people so that it takes some of the pressure off of us to oh, oh. do better because, yeah. oh, I don't have to use right. this as inspiration. They're, they're just a separate yeah. species. And I mean, what do you yeah, think about that? Sometimes athletes, you know, he's described as a freak. I mean, once in a while, they'll actually use the, oh, this new guy coming out of college and so on and so on. Well, not really. I mean, obviously, they're not truly. And normally, the, the, I mean, it's a commonplace in sport that the raw talent, if it's kept raw, <laughs> will not succeed, right? It needs to be cultivated in a certain way, disciplined in a certain way, trained, uh, not just physically, but in terms of the game and understanding enough of the nature of the game intellectually and the teamwork collaboration, if it's a team sport and so on. So real success um, does not result, you know, real and lasting success does not result from any native physical abilities. And, you know, long life of sports watching in general, that's my sense. Thank you. Thank you.